morning we're going to talk about what does Jesus, or excuse me, what does God require of you? Jesus does too. What does God require of us? And that's out of Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And I'm going to read from that passage, but we're going to deal with the basically the book, uh, because uh, part of what we have here in this passage of Scripture is we've got God's indictment against the people. And Micah is going to add, uh, act kind of as the mediator between God and the people. And God is going to bring his indictment and, and uh, the people are going to answer back. And, and then Micah is going to uh, mediate between those two and, and respond. And so we have in uh, Micah 6, 6 through 8, what the Lord says. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with your old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? He has told you, men, what is good and what is the Lord requires of you, only to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's interesting when you question people or have a conversation with people how or what they think that God requires of them or what God wants of them, especially once they come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. What do you think God wants you to do or what do you think God requires of you? And it's interesting uh, the kind of answers that you receive. Uh, you get all kinds of interesting responses to that question. Uh, some think it's observing particular rituals like going to church every Sunday or, or attending Bible study or, or tithing or uh, small groups or those kinds of things. Others think that it's observing um, uh, um, social ministry, doing social ministry. Others think it's maybe going on some special pilgrimage. All of these things, hopefully, to make God feel good, that you're doing something for Him, that you're going to make somehow, some way, you're going to make God feel good. I've got news for you. God's not going to feel good whether you're good people or bad people. Doesn't make any difference to God. Doesn't make any difference to God whether you're a good person or a bad person. It doesn't change God one way or the other. It doesn't affect Him one way or the other. You see, God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need your goodness, or He's not affected by your badness. He's self-sufficient. He didn't even need to create you. See, we've got this misconception in our pea brain that we somehow, some way, amount to something before God. We don't. We don't. God simply created us to love us. He didn't create us because He had to. He was self-sufficient. He created us to love us and to have a relationship with us and hoping in that relationship that we would want to have a relationship with Him. Not that He would have to command us to have a relationship with Him, but that we would want to have a relationship with Him. And that we would do that out of love for Him. And that we would serve Him willingly. And that we would worship Him willingly out of love. Now we know that didn't happen. We rejected Him outright. I mean, just flat rejected Him outright. But you see, God is self-sufficient. So what is He really looking for for a fully devoted follower of Christ? What is He looking for? Well, we're not going to diminish God or add to Him by our actions. We know that. So what is He really looking for? Well, you notice Micah tells us 
what God is really looking for. Now Micah and Isaiah were prophets to the northern kingdom. You see, when Solomon was reigning, the first half of Solomon's reign was great, wonderful. He served God. In fact, he had prayed the prayer before he ever started reigning. Um, you know, he prayed to God and God had come to him. Now, this is what you'd want God to come to you and say. Ask me whatever you want and I will do that for you. Wouldn't you like to hear that prayer? Wouldn't you like to be in your prayer life and God tap you on the shoulder and say, just ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. I'll do it for you. Man, you talk about carte blanche. Open-ended. Write your own check. That's what he said. Solomon said, well, you know, all I really want is the wisdom to be able to lead this, your people. That's all I want. And God said, wow, that's pretty good. No, he didn't really say that. I can imagine, I can imagine that kind of Okay, because God's used, used to us as, man, give me a million dollars, isn't it, and right? Give me a Ferrari. Give me this, give me that. Give me a house, give me a mansion, give me this, give me that. Give me the wisdom to be able to rule this, your people. That's all I want. And so God said, okay, since you didn't ask me for well, didn't, didn't you ask me for this and that, I'm going to give you all of those things. And he did. Solomon literally became the richest man who has ever lived. There's never been any man richer, nor will there ever be any man richer than Solomon. If you total up his riches, and you can find it in Chronicles, if you total up his riches in just one day, what it cost him to feed his menagerie. Now remember, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Now you can imagine what it took to feed them on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not counting all the servants and all the horses and all that, you know, all that stuff. What it cost to feed them for one day and put it at today's prices. You can imagine how much he had. And God gave it to all of them. Now he worked, he did great for the first 20 years. But the last 20 years, all that he did great, he did bad. He really unraveled the first 20 years in the last 20 years of his reign. To where it got the last years of his reign, the 20 years of his reign, God came to his successors and he said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. And he did. He took the kingdom from his son, Rehoboam. And he split the kingdom, and the only tribe that Rehoboam had to rule over was Judah. The other ten tribes became Jeroboam's kingship. And so now we have it where today, as we're talking about today, Micah and Isaiah are 
prophets to this northern kingdom. They're prophesying to Judah, this northern kingdom. And Isaiah is the prophet basically to the royal uh, house, Jerusalem. He, he's prophesying basically to Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, and the royal princes, the kings, the four kings, in succession. And Micah is out in the rural areas. He's prophesying to the rural people. And so we have these two prophets prophesying coincidentally at the same time. But both sets, both sets of peoples are committing the same sins. And so literally God is talking to the, these two sets of people about the same sins. And God is bringing charges against these people and Micah is mediating. And surprisingly, Judah says, we're guilty. We're guilty of what you're charging us. And what is he charging them with? We'll talk about that in a minute. But God inquires of them, and he sums it all up in basically two questions. And the two questions are this. He says, how have I burdened you? What have I laid upon you that has been so burdensome? In other words, what have I asked you to do that has been so burdensome? All of all I've asked you to do basically is obey me and keep my commandments. What's so burdensome about that? How, how have I burdened you? I mean, I haven't ask you to take a special trek. I haven't asked you to, you know, do this. I haven't asked you to do it. All I've asked you to do is to be obedient to me and to obey my commandments. And the second question is, what did I do to you to deserve such disrespect? What have I done to you to deserve such disrespect? You disrespect me. So what does he require of us? Now a requirement is something essential. It's a condition. And that condition is something that is expected and it is necessary. Now is it necessary for God? No. The requirement is not necessary for God. The requirement is necessary for us to increase or develop or hone our spiritual development. So the requirement that he is talking about here is to develop their spiritual development. To increase their spiritual development. So let's look at it. The first thing he says is, I require of you to do justly. To do justly. You notice that? He says, what does he require of you, man? He requires that you do justly. Now the phrase act justly means to see with God's judgment and God's wisdom. Now what have they been doing? Well, if you look over in chapter 2, where he brings about these, starts these indictments, he says, they covet fields and seize them. They also take houses. They deprive a man of his home and persons of their inheritance. They're stealing people's property. They're stealing their inheritance. They deprive them of ownership. They don't bring my words to good. No one walks uprightly. They force the women of my people out of their comfortable homes. They take my blessing from their children forever. And in chapter 3, aren't you supposed to know what is just? You hate good and love evil. You tear off the skin of people and strip their flesh from their bones.
You have false prophets who lead my people astray, who proclaim peace. And so he's got all of these indictments against them because they are acting falsely. He says, do justly. Act with my kind of judgment and my kind of wisdom. They are scheming. They're conniving. And they're taking what belonged to others as their own. They've lost all respect for others and they're not following the law of God as God had commanded them. They're not obeying God. Likewise, as God's ambassadors, we can follow that up today. As God's ambassadors, God's people, we are to be advocates for the rights of the unborn child. We're to be advocates for the fair treatment of the stranger in our midst. That means whoever they are, whatever color they are, whatever culture they are, whatever they are, whoever they are, we are to be their advocate as the people of God. Amen? We are to be their advocate. We are to take their side against whoever. Against whoever or whatever tries to oppress them. We are to take their side. We are to be their advocate as the people of God. Why? Because Jesus was. Amen? Because Jesus was. We are to be advocates for, for fair treatment of the elderly, of the poor, of the unfortunate. I did one of my doctorates on that very topic. If you take the Old Testament and the New Testament and run down the passages on the treatment of the widow and the poor and the unborn and the unfortunate, you will find that it talks more about that than it talks about heaven. It talks more about that than it talks more than it talks about giving. God is very serious, very serious about God's people ministering to the poor and the weak and the unborn and the widows and the orphans and those who cannot fend for themselves. And he commands his people to, to take care of them and minister to them. Now, I know Jesus said, well, the poor you always have with you. Now, Jesus wasn't making a flippant statement. Jesus was saying, you have to deal with them, and you will deal with them as my people. It's to be a major ministry of God's people. Because God is concerned about them. Because no one else will take care of them. Oh, yeah, well, welfare will take care of them. Yeah, if they meet this requirement, 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 if they meet this requirement. If they don't meet this requirement, there's the door. There's the door. And don't come back unless you meet the requirements. We are to take care of them as best we can, as best we can. Those who have special needs, the one who needs another chance, who better to give a person another chance than God, amen? Isn't God the God of a second chance? If he hadn't the God of a second chance, we wouldn't be here, amen? We've all had a second chance, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth. How many chances have you had? No, I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> We've all had more than our share of chances, amen? amen? Peter piped up, Lord, how many times shall I forgive him? Three? 
No. Seven times. How many? Seventy. Well, Jesus took perfect and he multiplied. That's what Jesus said. You, you forgive him as many times as even he needs to be forgiven. Tell me how many times you forgive him. Because God is rich in mercy. Amen. Rich in mercy. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Learning to live and learning to act justly only comes from consenting to be trained and learning to see God's wisdom. Arabian horses go through rigorous training in the Middle East. In fact, the trainer requires absolute obedience of that horse. And the way they train them is they deprive them of water for days. They deprive them of water. And then they take the horse and they release the horse. And they allow the horse to run towards water. And then just as the horse is about to plunge into the water, the trainer blows a whistle. And whatever horse stops, that is the horse that has been trained to obedience. And the horse that hears the whistle and stops and turns and comes back, pacing and stops before the trainer. And the trainer waits. And the horse is there quivering because it's thirsty. It's already seen the water. But the horse is also obedient. And when the trainer sees that the horse has learned its obedience, then he gives the horse the signal. And the horse can go drink the water. You see, we've got to learn obedience. We've got to learn obedience because we must consent to act justly because that is our only safeguard against the world and against satanic attack is obedience to God. Obedience to the Holy Spirit because when we don't obey Him, that's when we get into trouble. Amen? That's when we get into trouble. That's when we let our guard down. That's when we start trying to do things on our own. And that's when we get into trouble. First thing is to act justly. And the second thing is to love mercy. You notice he said love mercy. He didn't say act merciful. He said love mercy. Love mercy. There's a difference between acting merciful and loving mercy. Love mercy. Have you ever been shown mercy? Yeah, yeah. May have been a teacher. May have been your parents. I remember my senior year. <laughs> this is my college professor, my Hebrew professor. Anybody take Hebrew? <laughs> Lovely language, if you can read it. My, it was my senior year, my Hebrew class, my Hebrew professor, my final exam. I'd studied, oh man, I'd studied that stupid language. I'd studied, I'd studied, I'd prepped, I'd prepped. Got in his class, got in his study. He said, get out your Hebrew Bible. Genesis first chapter, first ten verses. Translate it, parse it. Opened it up, looked at it. That's Hebrew. My, my mind went absolutely blank. Absolutely blank. I translated it few words, parsed, parsed a couple of words. He was merciful. <laughs> he, 
he was merciful. He gave me a C. Didn't didn't flunk the course because of my other work. He was merciful. Gave me a C. Flunk flunk the final, of course, but uh, he was merciful. And I passed my Hebrew, but I mean, that's the only test I've ever taken that I looked at that test and absolute blank. After all the preparation, absolute blank. But, but that was the only oral test that I'd ever taken. And it was an absolute oral. There was, you know, you didn't write anything down. There was no multiple choice. There was no true or false. It was an oral test. You look at it, you translate it, and you parse it. Yeah, it's Hebrew. He was merciful. Didn't make any difference how much you studied. It took mercy. And he gave it. He was merciful. Our walk of God is to be that kind of walk where we're to love mercy. We're to love mercy. You see, God wants us to love it. And asking us to love it lies in the fact that when we love to do something, we will do it. If you love to play golf, you'll be out there playing golf. Doesn't make any difference what the weather is, what you know, what the day of the week is, whatever else is happening. If you love to play golf, you'll be out there playing golf. Amen. If you love to fish, same thing. It doesn't make any difference what the weather is. You'll be out there wetting the line. Yeah. If it's raining cats and dogs, you'll be out there with the cats and dogs fishing. Amen. Because you love. Ladies, if you love to shop, you'll be out there shopping. Amen? <laughs> you do what you love to do. Amen? Amen? If you love mercy, you will be merciful. If you love mercy, you will love, you will do merciful things. James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And Luke 6.35-36, but love your enemies, do what is good and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. When we love to see acts of kindness, we will be kind in return. Then finally, he says, to walk humbly with our God. To walk humbly with our God. Someone has said, we, who, we also understand walk to mean the pursuit of a way of life. To walk infers the choice of a path. Choosing to walk with God means we choose to pursue a life that conforms to God's leading and God's will. It is not that we are literally accompanying God on foot, but it does mean that in our day-to-day -day walk through life, it is with God. So when we walk humbly with God, our walk is to be a way of life, humbly with God. Now, it's not something we have to do to please God. We're not trying to please God. Understand, in all of this, we're not trying to please God. Or that we have to please Him. It is a way of life. I do it because I love Him. And I want to be obedient to Him. I want to follow Him. Amen? It's not because I have to. Or that I want to please Him. It's absurd out of my love for God. 1 John 1, 7-9 But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We walk in the light as He is in the light. Biblical humility Humility does not involve belittling, belittling ourselves. In other words, we don't walk around putting ourselves down. That's not biblical humility. 
biblical humility is I realize who I am. That I'm inadequate. That I'm nothing without God. It's because of God of who I am. Paul expressed it beautifully when he said, it's by the grace of God that I am who I am. It's Him who empowers me. It is Him who gives me strength. It is Him who encourages me. Amen. It's His righteousness that we're clothed in. Without Him, we're inadequate. And that's what we see. We have no dignity. We're, we're worthless without Him. Yet because of Him, because we're created in His image, and because we are created as recreated as new believers in Christ, that doesn't produce pride, that produces humility. I'm not proud that I'm in Christ. It humbles me that He thought enough from me of me that He came to this earth and humbled Himself. The God of the universe humbled Himself and became me. Because that's what he did. He humbled himself and became me. And died for me. A wicked, degenerate slob. And crawled upon a cross. and said, this is how much I love you. Yeah. And because I love you, if you believe in me, you won't have to die. You won't have to die. And that's humility. I am adequate without him. Since God is both our creator and our redeemer, our existence and righteousness depend totally upon him. A young man once received a medal from an organization which used extravagant language to describe his deeds. Jubilantly, he went home and described all the language to his mother. And then he asked, how many great men are there in the world today? His mother pondered the question for a little bit. Then she said wisely, one less than you think. One less than you think. Therefore, reading yourselves of all moral filth and evil excess, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you, James says. Chapter 1, verse 21. You see, when we walk humbly with our God, our life will demonstrate the characteristics that are evident in God Himself. The evidence of our walk will be witnessed by our acts of kindness, mercy, compassion, and justice. And those kinds of things. You may be here this morning. You may want to rededicate your life this morning. You may want to come be part of this church this morning. You may want to make a decision for Christ this morning. You can do all of those things this morning.